Uh, a moment to say hello to everybody. Um, so good morning in Europe. And then it's either earlier or certainly in Australia, it's later. It's a late afternoon uh, because one of our experts today and uh, at least uh, one member from the audience is from Australia. So there is late afternoon. Um, replicability, reproducibility um, are terms that we have uh, heard increasingly over the last 10 years um, across sciences. Uh, even uh, the replication crisis has been pronounced. And especially in linguistics, it's certainly for the last five years that this term replication, replicability, et cetera, et cetera, uh, has become ever more important. Today, we want to explore this notion um, a little bit um, with regard to its relevance to linguistics. Um, is it something that we, is it the new kind of gold standard? Uh, to what extent does this change? Should this change the way in which we design our studies? Uh, should this change the education of uh, early career researchers? To what extent does it change our publication practices? So, um, or is it only relevant for people who work quantitatively, or is this also relevant for people who work qualitatively? Um, we have to learn uh, from people, and uh, we. I thought one person is not enough for this. Uh, so uh, today, I've really gone to the limits, and um, in, I invited three experts who can tell us more um, about this. Three people who have also worked together, who've published together or in each other's uh, works, um, and certainly people who know their way around in, um, in all of these matters of replication, replicability, and reproducibility. Um, I will introduce them not all in one go, but rather um, immediately preceding the short presentations that we agreed on to have right at the beginning of this, um, of this online forum. And um, the three of them agreed that Joe should start. Joseph Flanagan from the University of Helsinki. He is there in the um, Department of English Philology in the Teachers um, Academy, and he has published quite a number of things on this topic. And I think this is also part of your little presentation already, where you can, um, where, where Joe wants to introduce us to some basic terminological issues, how we can orient ourselves in that world of replicability and reproducibility. Joe. Yeah, great. Okay, let me just share my screen. Um, okay, just really quick, the background is that I'm a university lecturer. It's just a title. University of Helsinki in English. And then here's some relevant work that I've done. Uh, one is from 2017, that's available online. I think most of that research was done 2015, so unfortunately some of the technology might be a little bit outdated, but the uh, general principles should still be valid. And then um, I did something for the Liddell opening webinar series on YouTube that goes over a lot of these different issues, and then I'm currently working on an article uh, that's edited by Michael Hall and, uh, and Martin on, um, again, spelling out what we mean by these various different kinds of terms. So the only thing I really wanna do in this presentation is just clarify terminology because there's a lot of terms that are circulating around and that sometimes people are talking about the same thing when they use different words and they're talking about different things when they use the same words. And from a linguistic standpoint, I would say it's really common to the same issue that surrounds the determiner versus determinative distinction, that I think everybody kind of agrees that there's a distinction between a category or a word class and a function. We just disagree about what to call it. And in uh, proposing these particular terms, I don't want to say that one is necessarily better than another. I think it's more the uh, conceptual distinctions that are important. But again, just for the purpose of clarification, we're going to try to stick to these terms so that it's clear what it is, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're talking about. But in any case, I think one way of thinking about how these different terms relate to one another is by a two by two table, by talking about what remains the same and then what differs under different analyses. So that if you're basically doing the same type of analysis on the same data, we're going to call that reproducible. And the goal here is that you get the same results as that that's reported in the original paper. Um, 
After that, it gets a little bit more complicated about what same and different means. But we could say that if you're basically doing the same type of analysis, but you're using a different data set, and the idea is to see whether or not that you get comparable results, uh, we're going to call that replicable. Um, if we're working with the same data set, but that we're applying different methods to that data set to see whether or not that the results more or less stay, quote unquote, similar, uh, we're going to call that a robust kind of analysis. And then if we're working with a, da a different data set with different approaches, we're going to say that the conclusions or the results are more generalizable. So just to make this maybe a little bit more um, concrete so people can see what it would be. An example of reproducibility might be um, Doyle's 2003 dissertation, where he basically wanted to say, let me take Phillips' 1985 study of lexical networks and see if I can get the same results. Um, you know, and this was literally trying to replicate or reproduce uh, the results using the same data set, using the same analysis. Um, an example of replication might be the debate between Miller and Leach on whether or not modal auxiliary verbs are increasing or decreasing. Uh, Miller reported that they're increasing, and then Leach went and then said, hey, no, look, actually, they're decreasing. Um, there's also been a study involving uh, Lebov's departmental store study in which that they go back now and then they try to kind of, again, see if they can get comparable results. Um, an idea about robustness, I think that there's a lot of things that we're looking at now. Sean Wallace has said that, you know, we're used to reporting things per million word frequency, but we might want to see, do we get comparable results if we have a different way of normalizing or calculating baselines? such as, let's say, per tense verb phrases rather than just by the number of words. And then Stefan has been doing, Stefan Gries has been doing a lot of work talking about, you know, there's a lot of different association measures and dispersion measures that are out there. And the idea is rather than trying to figure out what the quote unquote best one would be, how would the results actually differ depending upon which of these particular measures that you do? Do you still get comparable results or are they sensitive to particular um, techniques that you're doing? And then finally, with a different approach, this would be this notion of converging evidence from different kinds of approaches. And one might be, let's say that, um, you know, the results in corpus linguistics, ideally speaking, should also kind of be related to either psycholinguistic experiments or that you could say even dialect surveys, right? That if you're doing something talking about the profusion of lexical change, um, if you do a dialect survey and if you're doing a Twitter analysis and you're making an argument about what is the mechanism by which they change, ideally speaking, those would have similar kind of result, results. Now, again, what's the same and what's the different is always going to be a matter of debate because in a way that, um, you know, if you think about Lebeau's departmental story, it's not just simply sampling from the same population because a number of different years have passed since then. So you might want to say that these are not examples of replication. There are actually examples of either generalizability or something else. And I think that that's something when you start getting into the weeds about classifying it, um, you might come up with different um, ideas about what the reasons are if they quote unquote fail to replicate about what the issues are. But I think that this is just one way of thinking about what these distinctions are. So that's more or less all I wanted to say here. Um, in terms of just clarifying the terminology, just so that we have something to work with with the rest of the discussion. Great, thanks a lot, Joe. Um, so we move on to um, Lucas, uh, Lucas Söring from the University uh, of Bamberg, who has also uh, worked a lot, of course, as a as a corpus linguist and with statistical analyses of corpus data. Um, Lucas and I got to know each other in two thousand and eighteen. I think it uh, it was when uh, he and Valentin Werner organized um, a workshop at the, I don't know what it was, IL-6, IL-5 or so um, at, um, at University College in, in London. Um, and this was a really very interesting uh, workshop on the replication crisis in, um, in linguistics. Um, so we will certainly talk about that kind of aspect later on, but here is first of all, Lucas, and he wanted to give us a more personal take on this topic of replicability. Yes, thanks, Ben. Um, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, thanks for hosting this. Um, my name is Lukas Hönning. Um, I'm a, a postdoc uh, in Bamberg. And um, currently, my research focus is on uh, the statistical analysis of, of corpus data. Now, um, I think the basic point I would like to make uh, uh, here in the beginning is that I, we, we should probably consider this, this replication crisis uh, thing an opportunity. Um, now, uh, some, some people quite rightly uh, point out that we actually don't really know yet whether um, there is such a crisis in linguistics. But um, I think the um, methodological improvements and suggestions um, and innovations, um, they uh, enable better science in, in, any, in any case. So it should, we should be adopting them, um, disregarding uh, uh, the fact whether there is a crisis or not in linguistics. So um, I, I took the invitation to this uh, uh, forum as um, a, uh, an opportunity to, to kind of think about the ways in which I've tried to um, change my own routines in response to what I've learned um, uh, about this uh, uh, crisis. Um, and I think a, a sensible response uh, to this uh, 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 yeah, discourse would be to have a look in the mirror, um, the, the mirror of uh, uh, transparent research and, and open science, and um, to see how we ourselves um, have been uh, faring with uh, regard to that. And uh, 10 years ago, this is what I saw. So nothing, there was nothing there. And mm -hmm. um, I would like to talk about how I, uh, I've been trying to um, improve, okay? So uh, the, the few things I'm, I'm going to mention, I've um, written about them um, in a blog post, which you um, may find uh, on my website. And um, one final thing here is that I think if we try to um, take steps, um, they should be small ones. And we should uh, try to, um, yeah, upskill step by step because it's it's quite easy to to become frustrated. Um, at least that, that's what I've I've uh, I've learned. Um, when you try to um, you know um, learn how to how to um, adapt a reproducible workflow with scripting languages and stuff like that, it's it's it can be hard. Okay, so. Um, yes, so for workflow and reproducibility, uh, I quite luckily um, started using R early on, and um, I've been appreciating R Studio, um, the interface to it, and especially R Markdown. I've been only using that for about five years, I think. Um, and I think a pretty safe advice for anybody who is working with R is to try um, uh, as soon as possible to um, use uh, notebooks such as R Markdown um, uh, scripts. So uh, they're great, not just because um, they actually make it easier to work with uh, uh, with with data, but they they also offer uh, many more um, opportunities. So, for instance, um, I used R Markdown to typeset um, and then self-publish my uh, dissertation in 2020, open access, and um, the R Markdown successor, Quarto. I've been using this, for instance, to create my website as well and my blog. So that's been great. Oh yeah, here they are, uh, the mirror, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, more recently I became aware of a uh, what's called the tier protocol. It's kind of an approach to making um, uh, a, a statistical analysis self-contained and fully reproducible. And I've been starting to try to uh, implement that into my workflow. Um, I, I, yeah, I found that quite, uh, Quite helpful. Now, as for open science, I'm a fan of the OSF, the open science framework, and I usually have a project, an OSF project for every conference talk or other thing I'm, I'm, I'm doing. And I, I started using it just to drop my uh, slides there for anybody who, who's interested. Um, and um, by now, I'm also using it to um, post my uh, analysis scripts, figures, um, additional material, um, and, and so on. I don't use it to to make available my data. I um, uh, try to always publish them, um, what may be considered properly, and I can warmly recommend trolling for this. Um, so uh, uh, why um, why publish them on, on uh, a, 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 in a data archive? At trolling, uh, the data then undergo a, a proper review process, and um, uh, they're properly citable afterwards. And I think those are two pluses. Um, yes, so uh, even more re recently, I've started to um, try to make available um, my working papers um, before I, I submit them. 
And um, it's been quite handy to use Sci Archive because it's associated with the OSF. Okay, so um, a link uh, just pops up in your project um, to to that uh, um, manuscript. Okay, now finally, I think it's it's also important to to maintain and um, uh, have a uh, an active discourse on on the topics surrounding um, the the replication crisis. So I've been trying to to make an effort there as well. Um, as Band already mentioned, uh, Valentin Werner. Hi, Val Valentin. He's he's here. I saw him. Um, we uh, uh, um, organized a workshop at IL5 um, titled "The Quantitative Crisis: Cumulative Science and English Linguistics," and there were six papers on various statistical topics. Um, and I think it was quite a success. It, it, it drew um, a large large audience, and it um, terminated in uh, a special issue, which appeared in 2021 in linguistics. Now, another example that I'm, uh, or that we um, from Bamberg are quite proud of, um, in 2019, we hosted the, the Bicycle or Bicoki conference, and we included into the, the general program a, a talk series um, titled How To Open Linguistics. And these were um, invited papers that just filled uh, different slots through, throughout the day. Um, and they uh, talked about practical um, implications, so things we can. Um, yeah, uh, do ourselves. Okay, now I should also be talking about things I haven't done, okay? So um, the mirror remains empty um, uh, so far. Um, when it comes to workflow with regard to version control, now I'm convinced this uh, makes a lot of sense, but I, I find using GitHub very unintuitive and I've so far not uh, really integrated uh, version control into my uh, workflow. And the same uh, is true for uh, reproducible environments. And the idea, I think, is that in 10 years' time, software will have moved on and um, uh, uh, to, mm -hmm. to create uh, uh, such environments would mean that um, future people, including myself, will actually be able to, to run all the analyses that um, I'm running today. OK, and to my shame, um, I have, have never um, pre-registered a study. Um, it is something I'm, uh, I, I want to do soon. And I've also never uh, uh, done a proper replication study. Okay, so I think with these confessions in, in place, uh, I would like to hand over to, to Martin. Yes, okay. thanks, Lucas. Um, and um, you already sort of um, gave the floor to, to, to Martin. Let me just, by way of introduction, uh, say that Martin is a lecturer in applied linguistics at the University of Queensland and also an associate professor and principal data science advisor at the Arctic University of Norway, as I just said when, when I said hello to Martin. So I get, if you have the, the, the temperature average between Norway and Australia, then you probably end up somewhere in, I don't know, Tuscany or so. Um, he is a quantitative uh, corpus linguist. Um, he describes himself as someone who aims at combining and bridging the gap between computational linguistics and corpus linguistics. Um, he also manages large um, um, data centers, um, uh, for instance, and also the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory. Um, and among the publications, um, you may mention this anyway, Martin, but I thought I should mention it too. Um, it is next month that a special issue will appear um, of the International Journal of Corpus Linguistics, and you can read for yourself. It's spot on, a special issue on reproducibility, replication, and robustness in corpus linguistics. One thing he has not mentioned on his slides is that he was just, just recently, he's been elected vice president profession of the International Society for the Linguistics of English, so IEL. So um, today he is here as an as an expert mm -hmm. and as a guest, but from January, February onwards, he will also be um, on the host side uh, because he's now a member of the IEL board. Okay, Martin, and now it's um, your turn. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. And um, I, I think this is a great opportunity. Thanks so much for inviting me and thinking of me um, regarding this topic. I just want to go, go back real quick um, because I, I also, when I think back about myself, when I think about reproducibility and reproducibility crisis, we, um, I don't see it as a crisis. We don't have enough evidence um, to, to say it's a crisis in linguistics. 
but I also see it as an opportunity to improve our practices. And in this uh, respect, my concern is with upskilling. So I think that many people are very um, uh, are interested in basically improving the workflows and making them transparent and sharing with others uh, what they've done. Um, but oftentimes it's difficult to know how to do that, right? So Lucas initiatives are very good in that respect. Also, uh, Joe's paper was really fantastic. It's one of the prime examples that brought me uh, to this topic. And the lab that I'm, uh, I'm directing, the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory, um, is a infrastructure project that aims at really helping people in developing skills and giving tips on how to make research more transparent and reproducible. Um, and I think it has, has quite, quite success. So we have a great uptake, which makes me extremely happy. Um, and I just actually come from a workshop where I introduce people um, from very different disciplines to LADAR resources. With respect to the um, publication um, publications that I'm working on there, it's not only the uh, special issue of the paper that I'm working on, on with Michael Hall, it's also a co-authored uh, co paper with Monica Batnarek. Uh, and there we focus on uh, the use of interactive notebooks, which do exactly what uh, Lucas just mentioned, namely that we um, dockerize it's a weird expression, but we basically uh, create a machine that saves all the information about uh, what packages one has used, everything that one has done, so that it's basically reproducible even in 10 or 20 years. Um, but it focuses really on using notebooks um, for qualitative and interpretative research, because my aim is basically showing that it's not something that's only for quantitative researchers, where it's relatively easy often to convince them, but it's also something that's very important and will make, um, I think, qualitative and more interpretative approaches better. So that's something that I'd like to to raise in this discussion. Yeah, thanks very much. And I'm very happy that um, I was elected um, as, you know, now joining the IOBOLT. And yeah, very proud and happy about that. Okay, fine. Um... Hope I'm not muted. So um, I just thought I I ask a few a few sort of ice breaking questions, uh, and then after I don't know, five to ten minutes, uh, the audience should come in. And please don't don't hesitate to ask. Um, my first question is a very is a very basic one. Who has the time for replication studies? I mean, um, um, so who who does it really, and who should does it? Or is it perhaps rather something that we should recommend as a kind of training element for early career researchers and doctoral students or maybe master students? Any one of the three of you, it's not directed at <laughs> anyone in particular, wh whoever wants to answer. <laughs> so maybe I, I should uh, go ahead because I obviously um, haven't had the time to, uh, or I, I thought I didn't have the, haven't had the time to, to run a proper application study. Um, now, uh, I think the time argument applies to very many things um, uh, related to, to changing research routines. Um, uh, and I, yes, uh, I think uh, it, it's something that cannot be neglected, but um, I think the, the goal of, of actually running replication studies, this is, I mean, at least to myself, this is kind of one of the, uh, 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 yeah, more distant goals. So um, as I explained, I, I, I've been trying to um, start uh, working on my own um, uh, workflow and routines um, to uh, uh, at first um, try to not guarantee, but to, to at least try to make it uh, a bit more likely to uh, uh, produce replicable research myself. Um, and that includes reproducible research. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, I think something I, that came to my head um, in reaction to that question. Okay, anyone else who wants to come in on this? I don't know, Joe, Martin? I mean, I guess that I have two things to say. One is that I do think that replication studies would be interesting in the context of uh, teaching and classrooms and have students do it because you know, a lot of times we're asking students to do original research as MA theses, and they've never even seen a real data set before. And I think that if you think as a pedagogical practice that we have them walk through an analysis that's already been done, 
even then it's kind of challenging, but I think that you learn a lot more about the research rather than just saying that, um, go out, gather something, do something, produce a thesis, and then it gets evaluated, that I think that it would be a good pedagogical experience. And if we start incorporating a lot of this stuff within the teaching, because I think that within my own teaching, and I wrestle with this, it's like, it's very easy to teach articles, you know, in which we say, here's the article, this is what the people say, but we kind of say, but take all these things on faith, because we're not actually looking at the data or anything here, right? So when we're evaluating the argument, it's not really an empirically based discussion in the sense that we're looking at the decisions that they've made, we're seeing the results that they've done, that we're evaluating it in a critical sense involving the data. It tends to be more critical, I would say, at a kind of meta-analysis where it's the kind of larger theoretical or methodological abstract kind of principles that we're evaluating. So I think that it does have the potential to change teaching quite a bit. And then about the other one, about the time, I think that that's just simply because as a profession, maybe what we do is that we overprivilege novel results as opposed to building a foundation um, upon which to find scholarship in a way. Because if every study is kind of like, I mean, we do a lot of, we do a lot of replication studies if you take it in the very broad sense of that term. Um, you know, the date of alteration, for instance, has been studied in a lot of different varieties of English with a lot of different kind of data sets. Um, so in a way that you could say that that already is a type of, again, depending upon how you're defining the term, that might be replication. But we also might want to say, you know, what's wrong with actually saying that if these are the foundational articles that we want to say that this is what we're building the profession on um, about these kind of results, that we actually do do a study as close as possible to these original results just to make sure that they're reliable. So, but I think that that's a, that's a more like sociological idea about what types of research that we privilege and why do we privilege that type of research over another one? Because if that is privileged in the same way that original research is, then the time factor just disappears, right? Because it's just as worthy as a regular article. But I think that people think that it's not a real article. And if it's not a real article, then who has time to do it? So, but those are just my kind of thoughts. I should say, I'm not an expert. You know, I, I feel I, I feel nervous when people talk about this, about the term, but you know, but anyway, the, I just have thoughts, so. Yeah, I mean, the term <laughs> expert in general has become dangerous to some to some extent, but mm. but yeah, okay, fine. But I think it's uh, really thoughts worth sharing, Joe. So thanks mm. a lot for this. <laughs> um, I mean, I would I would just have a, a follow up question, and maybe that's that's directed to 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 Martin. I mean, um, replicability, replication studies. This is all about transparency, as you as you mentioned, transparency of data, transparency of procedures. You gave us. A brief glimpse at you know to what extent this notebook uh, procedure might help us to to create mm -hmm. transparency uh, transparency there, but for instance um, also about um, about the data. I mean uh, we may have different data sets, but if we have originally collected data, and the idea perhaps is to share these data for other people than to, to give them the opportunity to replicate something, but. Is there really a, a um, kind of a necessity to, to, to have to share these data? Because sometimes you want to work with them for a while, a, a little longer, and you have the privilege to use your own data. So what are the, the pros and cons of data sharing in, in that respect in order to achieve transparency? And can you give us um, also one or two more examples of transparency um, for procedures that you are using? Yeah, I, um, so Lucas mentioned um, that notebooks are, I think, a great really great tool and I think um, that if if I have if I were asked what was what would be the one tool that I would recommend it would probably be um, using notebooks as a way of documenting uh, documenting what one is doing and then being able to share them and with respect to pros and cons of data sharing so it's actually a very tricky question in a way right oftentimes we cannot share data because it's sensitive data uh, in Australia, oftentimes we deal with um, sensitive data relating to indigenous people, where it's not that easy where you can share data, but also when you work with children. Um, but also you have interests, right? So 
um, imagine you are a young, um, young researcher and you just put in a lot of time to collect data and maybe you don't want to give it away right away, right? Uh, because a big lab might come in and then just profit from all the work you've, um, you've been doing and uh, basically outcompete you in a way. So um, I, I became a little bit more hesitant about uh, completely open data because there are these negative uh, aspects like scooping and um, overprivileging um, labs with a lot of resources over individual early career researchers. Um, that said, so there are these negative sides, right? Um, equity issues, sensitivity issues. I still think that if um, if the data can be shared, it would actually profit the community, right? If, if data is is open. Um, so I would still I would still consider open data as as something that we should aim for. But I see it in in Kant's sense as an as a regulative idea. Uh, idea. Mm -hmm. um, so something that we should strive for, uh, although it might not be something that that is actually practically possible at the moment. And um, just with one one more minor point, uh, we also have to be aware that uh, we are very diverse in terms of our approaches, in terms of the domains that we work on, in terms of um, the fields of study that we're dealing with. And so different fields will have different uh, needs. And so um, some fields might actually have, um, it might be easier for them to adopt principles of openness and transparency and sharing our principles compared to other fields. And I think she would just be welcoming. So um, I, I think it's not it's not a must. It's uh, the more the better, but without forcing people. That's just my two cents on it. I have one more question, and then I open the floor to everybody else. Um, and um, it's something that, in a way, uh, Martin answered already in his uh, on one of his slides. Because my question was, should researchers who use qualitative um, approaches uh, also care about replication and replicability? And you said on one of your slides, yes, they they they, they should. Um, why and how? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's important because um, we are science. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we're quantitative or qualitative. Um, and in terms of um, interpretative approaches, oftentimes transparency is more important than reproducibility. So it's just really making sure that people understand what decisions have gone into selecting certain certain examples. What examples weren't good fits, right? Why were they co coded in a certain way? Making, for example, coding schemas available. And also more sophisticated methods like interactive notebooks, uh, like the one that, that Monica and I have been writing about. But these are more more sophisticated stuff. I'm really thinking about something very basic. Just you know, being transparent about um, you know what went into the analysis goes a long way, and that's true for both qualitative and quantitative research approaches. Yeah. All right. Okay. Fine. Um, now the floor is open. So uh, whoever wants to ask or offer a comment and observation is more than welcome to do so. So I'm waiting just for hands up. Um, 